The Intertalk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. And so we arrive at the final variation. Beethoven chooses to end his set of variations with a minuet, a graceful dance. And I find such beautiful symmetry in his design. We begin with a beer hall waltz, and we end with a delicate spiritual dance. Variations on a dance should end with a dance. <laughs> what an elegant idea. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. I'm all in a tizzy today because our guest is the fabulous Jane Fonda. She's giving an extremely touching performance in Moises Kaufman's new play, 33 Variations on Broadway. Not only that, of course, as we know, she's a social activist and the writer of one of the most splendid memoirs I've ever read. I love this book, Jane Fonda. <laughs> and welcome to Theatre Talk. Thank you. I'm <laughs> delighted to be here. It's been 46 years. Uh -huh since you have appeared on Broadway. Yes. Strange Interlude, I believe, was the play you did before this. Yes. Um, what, brought you, what brought you back to the theater? Moises sent me the play, and uh, I realized right away that I'd never read anything like it. I mean, it's very, very unusual. Did he tell you why he had you in mind for this play? Um, no, he didn't need to. I, it was, I understood very well. I'm perfect for the part, <laughs> yeah, yeah. if I say so myself. I'm, I am. Yeah. I'm, I just, the part and I are meant to be together. And tell us, the part is? I play a musicologist, mm -hmm. um, which means a scientist who studies music. Mm -hmm. And I'm very famous in the world of, arcane world of musicologists. And I am trying to understand and write a, a paper and deliver it at a conference why Beethoven wrote not one but 33 variations on a rather mediocre waltz mm -hmm. written by a music publisher in 1819. Diabelli. Yeah, Diabelli. Yeah. It's his famous Diabelli variations. And so there's this mother and then I have a daughter and I have a troubled relationship with my daughter that goes through the play. Parallel is Beethoven, a character in, in the play, and he is moving on his own trajectory and the two of us end up kind of crossing and past and present are woven together in a way that by the end of the play I think is very, very rich and moving, surprising, mm -hmm. um, Un, very unexpected. You know, people always say to me, I had no idea. I didn't expect this. And, and we should say that the character's been diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease as well. So you are racing l the life's clock. Really. Both of us. I yeah. am, and <clears throat> Beethoven is racing against clo the clock. And, and when you say that you knew this character, you could play this character, why? What, what in your own life drew you to it? Well, I'm, I'm, um, I'm used to giving lectures. I'm, of course, I, from I'm used you. to sp public speaking. Um, I am sort of always studying. I'm a student. Uh, I didn't do necessarily well in school, but I always study and I become obsessive and I go d deep down into things and write about them and um, so that the, the tone and the skills that this character have are very much what I have in life. And I'm used to talking to audiences. And um, I was writing, I'm writing a book. Ra Random House asked me to write a book about aging. It's called The Third Act, Entering Prime Time. Mm, perfect. And I was writing a chapter, <laughs> I kid you not, about how Beethoven and Monet did their greatest work when they were, in Beethoven's case, confronting deafness mm -hmm. and serious illness and Monet blindness. Mm -hmm. So that, it, and it's about how, you know, some people, even with age and even with physical challenges, um, rather than destroying them, it can cause them to go deeper. Mm. So I'm reading this play that Moises sent me, and there's a scene where Beethoven says to me, it was, finally I went deaf, I was so relieved, I was able to be with my music in a way that I never could before. And I've been writing that, and 
that was one of the things is I, I just felt I'm supposed to do this. Mm. And then, you know, it's not an easy play to read. I wasn't too sure. I was in Phoenix at a fundraiser talking about I just got this play, 33 variations. I'm trying to decide. A woman taps me on the shoulder and she said, I've seen the play. Mm. I said, you have? She said, yeah, I saw it in La Jolla. And I said, and? And she said, it knocked me over. She said, it's so powerful. And it was at that moment that I thought, I, I think I'm going to take a leap of faith and I'm going to do this. So and it was I, really magical. That it was magical. It, it was yeah. like faded. Yeah, I was supposed to do right. it. Is it also, though, when you're writing a book about the third act of your life, is it also sort of saying that since you hadn't done the live theater in a long time, that this now presents me <laughs> with something that I should be doing yes. in the third act of my life. That's very smart, Michael. You know, one of the things that I, I realized when I was almost 60, 60 would mark the beginning of my third act, my final act, the mm. first 30 years, second, third, last third. And that I wasn't scared of death, but I was scared of having regrets at the end of life when it would be too late to do anything about it. Mm. And I realize now that one of my regrets would be that I never went back into theater again, mm -hmm. that it was like an unfinished part of my life. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it that when I agreed to do it, that wasn't, but later I realized it, it would have been one of my regrets. Is this because we spoke over coffee a few weeks ago and you told me that your father, Henry Fonda, was never happier than when he was in a play. Yeah. Do you think that was part of the sense of you wanted to go back and try it again? I think so, yes. Mm. Now, why is that? Why is that? Well, why was he so what's happy? What's the satisfying he... thing about Well, no, I'm asking for you, what's the satisfying thing? I never thing understood it until mm -hmm. now, even though I did four plays, right. you know, 50 years ago on Broadway. But there's something about the immediate feedback. You're in control in a way you're not in movies. You know, in movies, you finish your work and then the director goes off with the editor and who knows together. what they do with what you did you know you're you're not you're not really in control of it in the theater every night you're you either show up or you don't you're either there 100% or you're not and you get it right away from the audience mm -hmm. And it's like a breathing character in the play. You know, the other actors, many of whom are seasoned theater people, wonderful actors, um, they said, you'll see, when you start to do this in front of an audience, everything will change. Yeah. It's, it's the missing piece yeah, that yeah. will bring you alive. And it's, it's absolutely true. And they're different every night. In your book, you talk about, while well, writing it, going into the zone of creativity in, the, in that wonderful introduction to your book. Mm -hmm. is that, how does that relate to the acting, what you go into? What, what kind of zone do you go into when you're giving a performance? Is it anything akin to the writing? Um, you go into a different zone, a different... but there, there is a zone. Yeah. And uh, it's just the, the minute you walk on stage, uh, now, is there ever any time that you can't get in it? I mean, that, that I, I had a brief performing career, and I remember, brief, this, is brief. Brief, this is why brief, this is why I stopped, <laughs> because there would be times that sometimes it would go great, and sometimes it would be you'd notice every, every movement of your hand, and I'd say, oh, I'm not doing that right, I'm not doing that right. Of course, that's what your actor's studio training is about, getting past that, the, the self-criticism, isn't it? Yeah, I... I I'm not saying it would be true in, in any other play, but in this particular play, um, I, I, don't, I don't feel that. I, last night, the Lincoln Center asked to record the play, oh, right. a three-camera yes. filming for their archives. Yes, of course. It happened yes. last night. I opened the play, right? My, the first line is, let us let us begin with the primary cause of things. I said, let us begin, and I forgot the line. <laughs> it, was, it felt like it was an hour, <laughs> although the you know, backstage people said, no, it wasn't that long. But I couldn't, it, I was nervous. You see, you know? this, this is because you become such a creature of the theater, Jane, that you put you in front of a camera, you don't know what to do anymore. <laughs> it's very different. Yes, it yeah. really is. Yeah. It's, when you plunged into the play, though, having been away from the theater for a long time, now we've seen, and I won't name them, some actresses who've come from the movies who don't do uh, as well on the stage. You've gotten rave reviews. Were there any particular problems, obstacles that you had to overcome to get back in the um, theatrical performance mode? I thought that that would be the case, Michael, but 
I was surprised at how easy it was. It just, I don't know. No vocal problem? Not at all. Not at all. I feel like I belong there. Mm. I feel like I'm coming home every night. I, I chomp at the bit. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. I just love it more than I ever imagined that I would. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope it won't be the last time. I, I really like it. So I love knowing who's in the audience. Oh, you do? That's unusual. Oh, you get the list of the celebs who are coming to see you? Well, I get binoculars. Well, no, no. How, how I do. do. How do you work that out? Don Amadolia bought me a pair of little opera glasses, and I look <laughs> oh, <how laughs> through the bookcase, and I look at well, who's be, out there. Be advised. But that, but that's so interesting. And of course, like, for instance, I Twitter you, Jane, and so I saw last night. You know, you you, you wrote who was coming, who you're going to have dinner with. Yeah, yeah. And do you, I mean, do you, do you are those like little celebs you see out there, and you watch them when? The, oh, they, it's not just who the celebs are. There have been a lot of celebs. I just yeah. want to see the faces oh, of the people. Oh, oh, I, uh -huh. So you, yeah. Hmm. Maybe I became I fixated last night. There was a guy sitting right in front of Tommy Toons that had a tight white shirt on that had the greatest arms I've ever seen. I just became fixated <laughs> on his arms. <laughs> or, you know, someone's hair. I'll say to Don, can you believe that woman's hair? Look at that. Anyway, I just, I don't know. It's like I'm making friends and becoming familiar with the people out there. And I move around to different places so I can see different parts of the audience. And I basically scan the whole audience. Good God. It's and like it, you're, you're Well, see, those... I spend so much time in the play talking yes. yeah, yeah, to yeah. That's the right. audience. Yeah. Once, once the lights come on and I'm there, I can't see who's mm. out there. Mm. But the fact that I've, I sort of know who's, you know, it makes me feel like they're my friends. So your next product is the Jane Fonda spy cam. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's over, uh, now uh, because you, you in your book where you give one of the best descriptions of the method, Lee Strasberg's method that that I've ever read. You say that tension is the occupational disease of the actor, mm -hmm. and that this entire uh, training is to find techniques to beat that, such as familiarizing yourself with the audience. But so, for some other people, that would make them very tense. I yeah, mean, Sally yeah. Field is a close friend of mine. And when I told her I did this, she just about passed Couldn't out. She could not believe it. <laughs> she doesn't want to know. Yeah. You know but she everybody wants the is, wall. Yeah. I, must every, say, I must say, I've never heard that technique before, but it's very interesting. <laughs> Nancy Walker, you remember the old comedian Nancy yes. Walker? Yeah. She used to, uh, when she was in On the Town originally, she had a little... Um, triangle cut in the curtain so she could go out and stick her nose in and smell the audience, <laughs> smell the house before the play went up. Smell. So she'd go and she'd stick her nose in and she'd smell and she'd go, death, and walk, walk <laughs> off just before the curtain went That's up. Right. It's an interesting technique. Interesting tale. Um, now, <laughs> your theatrical career begins with Lee Strasberg, really, right, at the, at the actor's studio? Uh, yes. When we spoke a few weeks ago, you told me he may have been one of the most important figures in your life. Uh, why? I, I resisted becoming an actor. I felt that I wasn't any of the things that you needed to be to be an actor. I was shy. I was. I thought I was unattractive. I, I just didn't see myself that way at all. And yet, the, you know, I tried to be a secretary and I got fired. I didn't know what to do to earn support myself. And um, I ended up in Lee's classes. And the first exercise I did, I'll never forget it, when it was over, you know, he, he then comments on, mm -hmm. and he said, you have talent. He said, I see a lot of people come through here. He said, you really have talent. Mm. And at that moment, it, I describe it in the book, mm -hmm. I felt like the top of my head yeah. came off mm -hmm. and birds flew out mm -hmm. and the color of the sky changed and I remember walking out of the building that day and I felt like I owned New York. I mean it was from that moment on I went to bed and woke up knowing what I wanted to do in life. And was this because Lee Strasberg was I think you It's because it was he didn't work for my father. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't an employee. He didn't have to say that. Mm -hmm. And he said it and it just gave me permission to become passionate about this this work. Mm. Now forgive this brief digression, but I, I can't help that. Why wasn't your father, the wealthy movie star, supporting you when you came, you know, because you do write about this in your book, you had to support yourself, but why weren't you getting support? Because your father was quite well off. 
Well, but and was a big he quite pack. rightly believed that that's not what that parents that should do no. with their adult children. Well, also, but they read the book that also I, th I thought that your your stepmother was the one who said. Well, I was going to say uh, at yes, the time that, he was married to a, that's a, right. very, a young stepmother who wanted me out of the house. Right. All right. <laughs> you know, and it, and it was right. It forced me to figure out what I was going to do with myself. Mm -hmm. But part of what, what pushed you forward, not to go back into your books too much, but the, the emotional obstacles that you were transcending, which were fueling your artistry, were quite remarkable. And at this time, you could, kind of had to get out of the house and go find yourself. You were on yeah. your own. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm grateful mm -hmm. that, that he, you know, he said, go and find you. And you know who I ended up room, rooming with? Um, uh, Jewel Stein's daughter. Oh, the, the, the sister of Jean Vanden Heuvel. Yeah, yeah. Jean oh, Stein yeah. Van yeah, 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 Susan yeah. Stein. Oh, yes. interesting. What a brilliant yeah. family that did is. Did your yeah. father, did he support the choice to try to become an actor? And what did your father, who was, you know, a, a wonderful, but shall we say, kind of an old-fashioned actor, what did he think of the whole studio method, oh. the whole Lee Strasberg kind of guru situation? He hated it. <laughs> And that's another reason it was good for me to move out. Because when I first started studying with Lee, I still lived with my father. And I, I remember I was preparing one of the sense memory exercises while I was living with my father. And I was working on it in the living room. And he came in and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm working on a sense memory exercise. And he just went, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this silent judgment, and walked out of the room. He hated it. But see, when he started, before he ever became a star, he'd done 300 roles in summer stock. Yeah. You know, it, that was his schooling. Yeah. When I came along, and it's even worse now for young people coming up now, it's so competitive. There are so many people trying to get in the business. When you go in for your first reading, you have to be a pro. You yeah. have to know what you're doing. There's no room for trial and error. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and so it's important to study. I, I'm not, there, there's more reasons why it's important to study beyond what I just said, but th that's one of them, and I'm awfully glad I did. Did your father ever discuss just, you know, uh, the techniques, the tricks, the trade of acting with you? <laughs> no. When you were, no, it just, there was no sort of, no. we can analyze the scene, break it down, oh, I'll no, read no, the no. scene. I remember, uh, I don't remember what the play was, but he was on Broadway, and he had an entrance in the second act where he came in and, he was in a very specific state of mind, and I remember asking him, one, you know, when you're standing outside the door prepared to come on, how do you prepare? And he just looked at me and he said, I think about my grocery list. I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, he always put, put that down. But, you know, I just um, had dinner with Jeff Daniels last night, not that I'm name dropping or anything like that, but uh, we were talking about God of Carnage. Yeah, uh, terrific play. Yeah. And, um, and he was saying how right up till the moment that the play begins, Marsha Gay Harden, mm -hmm. you know, is talking about, you know, her daughter's homework and stuff like that. And Jeff is just marveling that she doesn't have to do any kind of thinking about it, mm -hmm. wh whereas he does. So, you know, different actors. How do so you what do, you, yeah, yeah, sorry. what do you do? <laughs> what do I do? Yeah. I think it depends on the play. In this particular play, I'm blogging or twittering right before I go on, or <laughs> right. or looking at the audience through binoculars. It's um, I, I don't have to do any kind of preparation at all. Yeah, interesting. No. Interesting. Um, now we only have a minute left. Oh gosh, we're and here. and uh, well, well, and Jane, I want to ask you change the subject completely and ask you about this wonderful organization that you're so involved with that deals with. In the minute we have left. Yeah, well, no, we have a little more than a minute. I'm, I'm hyperbolizing for him because for him, one well, minute. Well, she gives me a minute. I want him one, to do another ten. Uh, that's five. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's Michael Riedel time. You've, you've caught me at my game. Uh, you, 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 you were working with this wonderful organization you created in Atlanta. Yes, um, it's the Georgia Campaign yeah. for Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention and the Jane Fonda Center for Adolescent Reproductive Health. And I focus on those things because well for many reasons but I as an I'm white I'm privileged I was my father's daughter and yet going through adolescence was very 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 painful for me and that is a period of time that has so much effect on what happens later uh, and so I thought well if it was that hard for me imagine for disadvantaged kids kids you know kids of color poor kids um, so many of these young kids in Georgia and in other states that have a large population that's poor, yeah, yeah. Uh, they have babies when they're really young. 
And so it's this generational cycle of poverty that keeps being perpetuated. Yeah. Um, poor parenting, dropping out of school, not doing well. And so we're trying to break the cycle. And it's not rocket science. You just need people, adults that are properly trained to know how to do it. And to give young women self-esteem, which no, is such... No, it's not just women. It's men, too. Oh, it is. Oh, yes. that's interesting. I mean, it's... Women and self-esteem is very much of a part, part of it, feeling agency. But for the men part of it, it's needing to teach boys knocking up a bunch of girls yeah. and having a bunch of kids before you're 20 doesn't make you a man. Yes. It's, it's needing to teach our boys what it means to be a human being, a full human being. That, you know, and the importance of being a father and how much children need fathers. Yeah. You don't just have them and then leave them. And it's, it's, it's profound stuff. I want to read something you wrote also. You said, if our, civiliz I'm sorry again. if our civilization hadn't been built on devaluing, fearing, and denigrating women, men wouldn't split head from heart and distance themselves from their emotions, which are supposed to be the domain of women. How long did it take you to learn that? Three husbands. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I'm saying nothing in this <laughs> bonding female moment here. <laughs> um, you know, it interested me, uh, you know, because I'm a woman and, you know, I thought that the book was going to particularly appeal to women. What really surprised me was the, how men responded to the book because I realized this issue of, you know, the need to be perfect. Mm. And what happens when you're trying to be perfect, because we're not perfect, that's really not, um, has such a toxic effect on men as well as women. The remarkable thing I learned about you in your book was when you, here you were, in my perception, the beautiful Jane Fonda, the young movie star Jane Fonda, and when, when you were going into your being married to Roger Vadim and doing Barbarella, and you said in the book, I began my career as a female impersonator, mm -hmm. that you, and you constantly speak of your of your that you thought you weren't attractive that you all oh, you know such a a negative self-image and so it's it's so instructive we think well if Jane Fonda had that was going through that feeling that she wasn't good enough imagine what you went through no no well, <laughs> <laughs> oh darling but <laughs> but you learn from that and you're you're bringing it to us but when did you start inhabiting yourself when did you stop being a female 60. impersonator and about about 60. 60. Yeah, that's why in my book I divide my life into three acts, and the third act is called the beginning. Yeah. It's because I felt, it felt like the beginning, that I kind of moved back in and took up residence within myself for the first time. And I think that that's one of the reasons that I can now come back to Broadway mm -hmm. as an inhabited person and own my space on that stage. Well, there's definitely, I mean, there is the star quality in the performance. You know, you feel, when you're watching you on stage, you feel this is a woman who knows her way around the stage. And I didn't even bring up Jane, my favorite movie. <laughs> the yes. old documentary, I which I've been, I've been needling you about a little bit in the but paper. But that is a wonderful movie. But it's a great, I think it's a very fine movie. It shows what the movie. theater is like. I can't but from, for me, we're talking about a documentary uh, yes. that was made. Yeah, okay. Well, we can say, no, Do we I need say. to explain yes, it? Yes, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I did a play that was so bad it lasted one day, and it just <laughs> happened that the very famous Penny Baker was doing a documentary of the whole process from the beginning to when I read Walter Kerr's review saying this is probably the worst play I ever. Which you read aloud in, front, loud of in front of the camera. camera. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you first raised this, when we met, yeah. I got the sense that you thought that I was like, oh my God, he knows about that. Oh my God. Whereas my attitude is, hard as it is for me to look at it. Yeah. I'm so grateful that there is that proof of how alienated I was. Mm -hmm. So really uncomfortable in my skin. Yeah. That I it because it shows how far I've come. Yeah, yeah. Do you but know? Yeah. Also in that film you're a beautiful, raw, young woman. Scared. Yes, that's that's so scared. No, I see I find I find so and Uncapable of standing up to myself yeah. while that bully was yelling at me. You know? The director. What, what was that Andreas? fellow? Andreas. Andreas, right. He lives in Paris now, doesn't he? I don't know. He was. <laughs> <laughs> 
He was, by the way, Andreas, I, Andreas, what was Vutsinas. Vutsinas. He, our viewers will know him as um, the boyfriend of the director in the movie The Producers. Right. Carmen well, DeGhia played Carmen, Carmen DeGhia. Right. Yeah, but no, well, I, I, but, no I, just, I just wanted to say, though, I find that movie completely fascinating, even more now, having seen your performance on Broadway, because you see an not an unformed actress, but an unformed human being. Human being, right. Yeah. And so you've grown up, Jane. Totally, I've grown up. <laughs> Look at you now. And I just, you know, not everybody has, can actually be witness to that. I can witness my own growing up because of that. So now, <laughs> the, now the true genius phase can begin, right? <laughs> yes, right. Here we go. Uh, Jane Fonda is terrific in 33 <laughs> Variations, Moises Kaufman's new play about a, a woman who's um, uh, struggling with uh, facing death to unlock the secret of a great piece of music by Beethoven. And you won't find a better performance in New York than Jane Fonda's oh. in that play. Good to see you. <laughs> Thanks. I thought you liked being a costume designer. I do. Clara, you're never going to excel in any field if you